Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Chatting with the Experts TV show hosted by me, Ola Okone. Every week I bring to you an incredible woman, a woman that fascinates me, and I know you, with her story, but even more so, she fascinates you by what she brings to the table. The mission of this show is to inspire, is to empower, and is to educate each one of you that tune in or listen, because I do have a podcast. And today is no exception. I have an incredible guest, and I'll tell you a bit about her. Her name is Dr. Irene Olumese, and she's an author, an inspirational speaker. She's a Bible study teacher and a certified faith-informed professional transformational trauma coach. She is the founder and executive director of the Feet to Grace Foundation. As the founder and executive director of the Feet to Grace Foundation, which is a charity organization that provides prosthetic rehabilitation services for amputees in Nigeria, Irene facilitates amputees' emotional well being and empowerment. She is the author of Grace in the Storm, a living proof. And she's driven by a desire to help people live victorious lives, irrespective of the storms they face and to make their pain count as gain for others. Her book, 55 Chapters of God's Grace, is a compendium of God-inspired lessons that Christians must imbibe to take full delivery of God's promises and manifest his purpose here on earth. Our topic is going to be transforming pain to purpose, power, and profit. And with that, I welcome my guest, Dr. Irene Olumese. Thank you very much, Paula. Thank you. It's a pleasure and a honor to be with you this evening. Thank you. I am honored that you are my guest because you inspire me. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to have you on. Because if you inspire me, I know you can inspire others. So as you, my listeners and viewers, the topic is on transforming pain to purpose, power, mm -hmm. and pain. There's a reason that we have that as the topic. Yeah. So I'm going to ask Irene if she's willing to share her story with us. Okay. <laughs> yes, of course. And uh, thank you once again, Paula. I will try to do a mother of all summary of my story. I'm a long transplant survivor and a bilateral amputee. Oh. Now, how did we get to that? So I lived for 20 years with a chronic respiratory disease called myasthenia gravis, uh, sorry. <laughs> I lived with a chronic respiratory disease called bronchiectasis and a debilitating neuromuscular disease called myasthenia gravis. Mm -hmm. And we got the indication that something was wrong in 1993 when I started coughing and fast forward to June, 1993, I had to have the first surgery on my lungs in my chest, me and fist, a cyst the size of my fist was taken out from between my heart and my lungs. Wow. And we thought that was the end of the story, but no. That just opened up a, a complex syndrome that kept me coughing nonstop for the next 20 years. Oh my word. I, I mean, it was literally coughing every day and with everything else that came with it. We did not quite know what we were dealing with. Um, what was all of this? I got a diagnosis in 1997 when my doctors actually gave a name to it in UCH in Nigeria. And I needed a second opinion. So I went to Ohio Medical Center in the US and I got a second opinion. And it was exactly what my doctors in Nigeria had told me. Mm. And the added information was that depending on the progression 
of the two combined diseases that I may end up in a wheelchair within the next five years, unable to do my basic daily care even of myself. But in the midst of all of this, I had two sons. I also completed my doctorate and I was working with an international organization. And so when we got this diagnosis, all my friends asked me, look, you need to stay back in the United States. And I said, no, no, without my family. I have a good job, I have medical insurance, I get my medications and I'm going back home. And that was exactly what I did because for me, I did not want this situation to redefine my identity mm -hmm. or to define how we're gonna live as a family. Mm -hmm. And I was not ready to be in any country where I couldn't have my family with me. I had two young sons. And so I went back home to Nigeria at that time and continued working. And in 2001, I got an international appointment with my organization and I was transferred to Ghana. And while I was working in Ghana, in the northern region of Ghana, that lungs collapsed. And so I was in a place where there was no medical facilities to take care of me. And I could not be flown anywhere because of the state of my lungs. And so my organization tried to get me to Burkina Faso, which was five hours drive. They said, no, don't bring her because we don't have facility to take care of her. So they right. put me in an ambulance, no oxygen, no air conditioner, 10 and a half hours from Tamale to Accra. Wow. <laughs> it's still a miracle how I made it alive. Yeah. Yeah. And after spending about six weeks in a hospital in Accra, having the pleural effusion drained and all of that, I had a tube inserted in my, on my side and things were not making any difference. I had to be medevaced to Switzerland. Mm -hmm. My husband was already working here with you, and it just made sense that I should be brought here. And so I came here in 2003, exactly 10 years after the first surgery, and had the second surgery on my lungs. Mm -hmm. At this time, I was in a managerial position in my organization, and I was looking at breaking into management, and it wasn't, quote-unquote, an ideal time for a woman a professional woman to be coming out of work. And I had I'd always run with this policy that a woman has a, a, a multiple role of reproduction and production, and she should be able to manage both. And she should have an enabling environment to manage both. I should not have to sacrifice one for the other. Mm -hmm. But at this point in my life, I had to make a critical life changing decision to come out of work, to take care of myself, and relocate my children to Switzerland and settle them here. Mm. And it was now not only having to deal with my medical situation, I also have to deal with significant financial challenges as well. Yes. Because we had made plans on the basis of our two salaries. We bought a house, took a mortgage, took a loan to pay the 20% that is required by Switzerland, which you have to bring from outside as a, a foreigner. And wow. all of this was happening in the midst of raising my young boys, managing my health, and just try to find a balance. Where do I go from here? I had put so much into my career. It was a dream career, and I really wanted to excel. And I knew I was doing a real good job, but where do I go from here? Well, I came out of work and spent the next couple of three years literally having heart palpitations at the end of each month, you know, when the bill starts running in. So the financial challenges was really intense. I mean, it was as bad as the bank declaring my account delinquent oh my because God. I couldn't make uh, my payment that was due. Okay. I mean, I did everything that I could possibly do. Mm -hmm. I sold salad master pots. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I tried Herbalife. Life. I tried mm -hmm. Mirke. I mean, just to keep something coming in because it was huge bill we had huge bills coming in yes and fast forward to three years later 2006 i uh, got provoked a recommendation for me and i was recommended for a position in cairo so cairo, i packed my egypt. bags yes in cairo in egypt okay packed okay. my bags left my sons here in switzerland and went to cairo what i was doing was to come home one long weekend every month to check in on the family and make sure they're doing great and did that for a year 
And then again, I had another relapse on my lungs. While you were in Cairo? Time. While I was in Cairo. Oh, <laughs> While I was in Cairo, I was actually flying back into Switzerland for my usual one long weekend. Mm -hmm. And it became very difficult to breathe mid air. And mm -hmm. as soon as we landed, I had to be taken straight to the hospital. And then my doctors told me that my lungs were no longer holding sufficient air to oh give God. me the amount of oxygen that I needed. Mm -hmm. So my oxygen saturation was incredibly low. Mm -hmm. And for them, the only solution was for me to be on oxygen supplementation 24 hours a day. And we're like, okay, <laughs> how are we going to operationalize this? Mm -hmm. I, I have a job to finish in Cairo. I mean, they looked at me and said, are you crazy? <laughs> what are you talking about here and for me it's i have a life to live one and two i have a policy of when i start something i need to finish it mm. because i mean that's something that i've been struggling with all my life not having uncompleted projects mm. and it was also a strategic project i was working on i couldn't just walk out of it mm. and it was one that has also been incredibly challenged and as a Christian, I believe that he who set his hands on the plow and looked back is not fitted for the kingdom of God. That yeah. one side, two, I'm a Christian and the only Christian in that group, you know, leading that, that team. And the interesting thing is that all the four of us leading that trip, to, uh, you know, I as an international officer and two other, uh, three national office specialists, all of us had significant life-threatening challenges in that season wow oh my so word. for me it was no longer this was not just natural something else was at play i mean how could the four of us excuse me all mm -hmm. come down one had a fire outbreak at home and sustained a, a second degree bond one oh, had man. an accident and broke a limb and another you know an elderly lady who two sisters living together one died and they've been living together all their lives and i couldn't come back from switzerland so for me there was more at play and i had to bring in my christian perspective here mm -hmm. and um also had a conversation with my doctors look i need even if i'm not going to continue to work in cairo i must finish this project i must see it to a logical conclusion mm -hmm. what you need to tell me is what do i have to do to make this happen but mm -hmm. not going back to Cairo to finish is not one of the options I was ready to take. Mm -hmm. wow. So my doctors looked at me and, and they've definitely thought this woman has lost it. Yes. Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> but one of them is an elderly uh, professor and he said to me, look, our treatment, when we relate with the patient, it's always holistic. We know you, we know your passion, we know the way you work and the high premium you put on your profession. Mm -hmm. We will give you the conditions. And if you can meet all these conditions, we'll allow you to go back and finish. And I said, give me the conditions. One, I was to have oxygen in my office, oxygen cylinder in my office. At Two, all I was to have an oxygen cylinder or concentrator in my apartment. Mm -hmm. Three, I have to have a mobile. And then there was not a lot of options and so there was this little canister that I, I could just spray on, you know, to give me oxygen. And so I they gave me the three conditions. I sent a message to my friends in back in Cairo and to my office. that this is my situation. The office agreed for me to have, because I had to have a permission for that. The office agreed for me to have an oxygen canister and mm -hmm. uh, a cylinder in the office. And my friend said, look, we're not going to let you stay alone. We're, we'll get the oxygen concentrator. We're moving it into our apartment, our own home, and they moved me into their home. Wow. <laughs> and, and it was just, it was just strategically located there to be God's hand supporting me in that challenging season of my life. Mm -hmm. And they put their driver and car at, on, at my disposal. So I could go to work in the morning with my canister sprayed on. I get into the office, I link with my cannula, and mm -hmm. I was running my work and under the circumstances. We're literally walking around the clock. And um, to the glory of God, we were able to complete that project in about seven weeks. Okay. And I recall that when we, we prepared the presentation to the government, 
because I'm an international partner supporting, the first presentation has to be made by the national partner. So there are two of us lead and then the supporting uh, specialist. Mm -hmm. And when the lady, the national coordinator was going to make a presentation and um, she said something that has remained with me till today. She said, it was by the grace of God and the perseverance of Irene that we have been able to finish this project. And I'm sitting down there and I'm stunned. And all I could say is that, God, there is a purpose for this. Yes. I don't know why we had to go through all of this, but this is going to leave a lasting impression on this woman. And I pray that will be the turning point for her to become a Christian. And we made the presentation, I made mine. It was applauded, it was well received. Submitted the report. I packed my bags at the end of 2007. January 2008, I returned back to Geneva. And now I'm you... coming back to a snow blank agenda. All I had was to take care of myself, nebulize, medicate, respirate. That was it just medicating and nebulizing to keep my chest free. And I was doing all of this all the way to, to th towards the end of 2008, I was really bad and I ended up in the ICU. <laughs> and I, I just couldn't even, I didn't know how we made it through that. Fast forward to, and that was too much for me. That was too much. How do you pray? How do you pray? What do you do? Mm. And the, the, the interesting thing was that this is the same doctor who's been managing me since I got into Switzerland. And he's just been strategically located at the right place at the right time to push my case. Mm. And he told us that he actually had presented me for lung transplant in 2008 and it was thrown out. That I had complicated medical history. Mm. And they raised tons of questions. And he spent two years going from one respiratory conference to another, presenting my case to get an answer to those questions. And it was after he had done that and re represented my case that he informed us. So he had done a lot of work on my behalf that we had no clue about. Mm. Mm. And of course, we had to go through the whole walk up uh, to, to see if I was a suitable candidate. Mm -hmm. Now it has to, the way Switzerland work, there's a specialized center for each different kind of transplant. And um, the doctors in the other hospital were not impressed with my history and didn't think I could be a suitable candidate. So now I had this battle to fight. Well, not me fighting, my doctors fighting to justify why I should be on a waiting list. Did they give any got... reason, though, for saying you they didn't think you were a suitable candidate? Did they think that you weren't um, going to make the surgery? What was their reason? Yeah, they said that I had too, too many surgeries on my chest um... and they feared that there would be adhesion. Okay. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. They feared that the process of taking out the old lungs, if there is an adhesion, I would bleed to death on the table. Uh... And, well, that was the main reason they gave me. Mm -hmm. I don't know what else was going on behind their mind, but it was a struggle because the way that was delivered for me really stripped me of hope. But I refused to give up on hope and I refused to give up on the fight. So my doctors were fighting for me and I was fighting as well. Mm -hmm. And so I got on the waiting list and waited three years. That's from 2000 and... From 2010 to 2013. And then January 2013, you know, every time my friends call me, we, we had a group of friends who were praying along. We just, as soon as I got on the waiting list, we just called up a few friends and told them, this is what we are facing. And we needed them to pray along with us. And all we were asking them to pray is for God to keep me alive until a suitable candidate is found for me. Right. Because I simply could not pray that somebody should die. And while I was struggling with that, God led me to Isaiah 43 
And it was like, because you're precious to me and I love you, I give Egypt for your ransom and silver for your sake. Mm -hmm. And I give men in exchange for your life. When I read that, I mean, it floored me. This is how precious I am to God that he's willing to give a life for me. And so my only prayer throughout that period was that the person who is going to be the candidate that's going to provide me with the lungs that will keep me alive will also be a candidate for heaven. 